I'm Alex Honnold, and today I'll be answering your questions on Twitter. This is part two of Climbing Support. First up, from Jordan Harlow. How do the really hardcore rock climbers that go on multi-day climbs go to the bathroom? Do they just go and hope no one down below gets hit? So that is how people did multi-day climbs in the 60s and, and 70s. Way back in the day, people would just go to the bathroom into like a brown paper bag and just throw it off the wall. That is incredibly frowned upon now. That is definitely not the way. Nowadays, you pack everything out. So when I go multi-day wall climbing, I typically use my used water jugs. Basically you poop into a bag, you bundle up the bag, you can like duct tape it up. So it's like a little sealed bundle. And then you can leave it in like your used water jugs and then seal that up with tape. And then you basically wind up with sort of jugs of waste dangling below your actual haul bags as you climb the wall. And then when you get to the top, you just like hike your waste out and throw it away in a dumpster. Next question is from Kate Warburton, who asks, doesn't a bunch of climbers climbing a mountain mess it up? That's a fair question, though it could also be applied to don't a bunch of hikers going outside mess it up or don't a bunch of fisher people, you know, overtax the stream. I would say that in terms of outdoor recreation, climbing probably has a lower impact than many sports. And there just aren't that many climbers, though as climbers, we aspire to leave no trace and, and to leave things how we find them. So, you know, not to make a mess, not to disturb anything. Climbers definitely aspire to, to be good stewards to the environment. Uloha, Hawaii. Can you find what's wrong with their repelling technique? seen in a physics textbook. Well, first off, they spelled repelling wrong, so that's what's wrong with the question. Second off, oh my God, I can see what's wrong with the technique. Yeah, the first problem is that there's a guy holding the other guy who's repelling, and this is all very dangerous, and they're both about to die. But I do think that the point of this illustration is to show the forces, and I think their forces are technically correct. But everything else about the technique is a death trap. <laughs> Next question comes from Zach Rudin. He says, I need help with my footwork. It's friggin' lousy. Who's got insights here? And this is actually something I could talk a lot about because I think footwork is the most important thing in climbing. Your hands, your arms should be just maintaining your balance, like keeping you attached to the wall, but your legs are what actually push you up as you climb. The biggest beginner mistake with footwork is that they place their whole foot onto a hold the way you would if you're just like walking in street shoes. They just kind of put the meat of their foot onto a hold. But really you want to place the tip of your toe on that hold because that allows you to be a lot more precise in how you maneuver your foot afterwards. Because if you just put your whole foot flat against it, you can't swivel and like turn your hip either way afterward. You're just kind of locked into the position that you put it. Whereas if you place the tip of your toe, then as you move higher, you can swivel your foot around as you need to maintain your balance. A next question from Jeff Ballard. Okay, about to tackle each of these. A rose move, bat hang, knee bar, and bicycle. Who's got tips for Jeffrey? <laughs> Jeffrey just listed every sort of trick move in climbing, like every sort of bizarre rarely used but very showy and sort of fun maneuver. Basically each of these moves is something you only use when nothing else works. Because typically when you're climbing you can just hold on to holds and sort of climb normally the way you imagine climbing where you like raise your feet and you stand up and you grab the next hold. It's very rare that you have to use something like a bicycle which is what it's called when you push one foot one way and then toe hook with the other foot so you're basically applying counter pressure with one foot pushing and the other foot pulling to like squeeze the same hold. The only time you really do that is when you're climbing in really steep caves and, and roofs and things and there aren't any other footholds to use and you have to like squeeze the same foot together. A rose move is what it's called when you take a hold and then you swing through underneath to the next hold. And it's actually so named from a route in France called the, the Rose et le Vampire that a man chipped. He basically artificially created some pockets that like force that kind of movement. And it like looks like a circus trick. It's pretty cool. A bat hang is when you hang upside down by your toes. If you imagine like a bat hanging out of a crack. A bat hang is a legitimate way to rest sometimes because if you find the right little thing to hook your feet on, you can let go with your hands and rest your hands. But it's rare that you want to dangle upside down by your toes intentionally. Knee bars are probably a more common way to rest when you're climbing. A knee bar is kind of like a bat hang in that you wedge your knee against a hold, but they're kind of like bat hangs. It's just a way to take weight off of your hands. Next question comes from Jamila Williams. She says, serious question. What does a professional rock climber do? Like they work for a company or they just compete in competitions? That is a fair question because professional climbers don't necessarily do that much. <laughs> no, there, there are many different paths to being a professional climber. Some people do just compete in competitions and earn money from the winnings and then sort of support themselves that way. Most professional climbers make a living through sponsors. So they have a contract with say equipment manufacturers or apparel manufacturers, and then they get paid for a certain number of appearances a year. So they show up at climbing festivals or events and they, they maybe give talks or show films, teach clinics, things like that. They write books, they write guidebooks. And then a lot of professional climbers are also just guides. So they take people climbing. 
Next question is from Stanky Hazel. Someone please show me a proper sloper technique. I can't figure it out. And a sloper is, is like a very sloping hold. It's something that you can't just like hold with your hands. It's like brute hand strength isn't necessarily enough. You need to engage your whole body to stay tight to the wall. And then mostly you position your body in different ways to make the hold feel better. For really bad slopers, keep your, your center mass below it, like stay underneath the hold more. But I think a lot of being able to hold onto slopers has more to do with strengthen your core and your shoulders and sort of like your whole body. If you're reaching to some hold and it feels terrible, you're like, okay, well, that's not a great hold. But then if you shift your whole body to one side, all of a sudden the hold feels a lot better because you can compress it be between some other hold. Or, you know, you can engage it in a different way. It's not always that the, the hold is the problem. I mean, oftentimes your body position is the problem. Next question comes from Laura Owen Ansi. Help needed from the climbing community. How should I improve jumping and dinos? It's partly a question of confidence and partly I'm just not that bouncy. Well, I feel like she answered her own question. If she is struggling with dynamic movement because she's not confident, and not very bouncy. Those are two obvious ways to improve her, her dynamic movement. <laughs> Dinos, or dynamic movements, big jumps, come from confidence and physical dynamicism, like the bounciness that you have. So some of it is the springiness and like the amount of power that you can generate, like how much can you actually jump. Some of it is the confidence to believe that you can jump to a hold and actually catch it and, and not swing off and hurt yourself. You know, I think that confidence gets developed through practice. You know, if you do a bunch of dinos, you're gonna have some confidence that you can actually do them. And then the bounciness is just a matter of fly metrics and stuff like, can, can, you, can you jump? Can you, can you catch things? You know, how powerful are you? Michael Torres, 45. So, rock climbing is harder on my shoulders than I thought it would be. Any suggestions to minimize injuries? That's a good question. Climbing is relatively hard on your shoulders, or it can be because it's an overhead sport, so you're like loading your shoulders in a fairly vulnerable position all the time. You can minimize injuries by focusing on technique, and, you know, sort of building up to it over time, you know, strengthening your shoulder joints as you go. Try not to like shock load your shoulder. Focusing on form, like how you engage your shoulders, like keeping your shoulders down and low, not hunching too much so you don't, don't scrunch the joint. And also just maintaining mobility, flexibility, like stretching, doing opposition stuff, making sure you're, you're all balanced. There's a lot to maintaining healthy shoulders. Question from Explore It. He says, climbers, what's a good but cheap entry-level climbing shoe good for all types of climbing? That's actually not the best question for me because I haven't used an entry-level shoe since I was about 11, I think. Well, depending on how serious you are about climbing, I think you outgrow entry-level shoes relatively quickly. Most entry-level shoes are just cheaper, but they're also typically flatter, which makes it more comfortable on your foot. Like elite high performance shoes are often more curved and hook shaped, more like a talon so that you can pull with your toe. Basically climbing shoes are all built for specific tasks. Like they do different things. You know, it's like a different arrow in the quiver. It's like you want the right arrow for the right task. Yeah, so the shoe I have here is, um, this is like a high performance ratio. You see it's ultra soft, so you can bend down. It's also sort of naturally hook shaped. It's downturned, it's asymmetrical where the shoe curves around to put all the weight on the big toe. This is my go-to gym shoe. This is what I use for climbing indoors and for, for climbing like training on boards. Basically, this is like a very high performance sock that puts all of your weight onto the tip of your big toe. Another question from Stanky Hazel. I just turned 30 and I'm climbing better than ever, but when should I expect to feel my body slow down? I wanna age gracefully on the wall like a mountain goat, not like some old worn out chicken tumbling down like a fool. There is a lot to unpack in there. It concerns me that they're worried about aging at 30 because I'm 36 now. So I'm sort of like, wow, I feel like I'm climbing better than ever and I'm doing well. So hopefully they can make it at least six more years before they begin their steady decline. I would say that climbing has more longevity than most sports just because it's relatively low impact on your body. So you can be climbing at an elite level into your 40s, 50s, 60s. For example, actually in town here, I've been climbing with a professor who has a full-time job who's climbing 514. So like climbing at an elite level as a 61 year old. Ethan Whitehill, is bouldering just rock climbing where they charge you more and give you less safety equipment? That's not far off, because if you go to a bouldering gym in a lot of cities, they do charge you a lot and they give you nothing. But bouldering gyms are very fun. I think he's being facetious, but you know, it's kind of clever. Next question comes from do now, imagine later. Please help, should I eat this 20 piece McNuggets before climbing stones and Joshua Tree? What are climbers diets like? You should not eat a 20 piece chicken McNugget before going climbing. In general, you shouldn't eat it at all, because it's gross. But I would say most climbers are relatively mindful of their diet. Next question comes from MSR Gear. For mountain climbers, what's your favorite season for climbing and why? Almost everybody likes the autumn, you know, fall. People call it a September or a Rocktober, things like that. Basically uh, when conditions start to get a little bit cooler, but it's also dry. Nowadays, September is kind of too hot in the Western US, so it's kind of drifting into November and, and December even. But yeah, basically the, the fall is, is ideal for climbing conditions. Palimigo. I wonder who first tested those tents the mountain climbers sleep in, hacked into the side of a mountain. I wager they were insane. Most of the big equipment manufacturers were founded by climbers who 
were manufacturing the gear for their own use. Companies like the North Face and Patagonia and uh, Mountain Hardware, they were all established by climbers who were making the gear that they needed to go on climbing trips. I would say that that they tested their own gear. <laughs> you know, nowadays, most of that gear is tested by athletes. So for me as a North Face athlete, I get a lot of prototype North Face gear and then use it in all kinds of crazy places. Like I went on a climbing expedition to Antarctica where we used a whole new kit of gear. And we're like, well, we survived Antarctica. I guess it works okay. <laughs> it's probably all right for Brooklyn if you can make it through Antarctica. Next question is from Towns Widger. What does it take to ascend the hardest climb in the world? It takes very strong fingers. From Jake Ireland, how does a climber approach climbing different types of rock? Kind of a broad question, but I think the simple way is you just practice on a lot of different types of rock. So you sport climb on limestone, you climb big walls on granite, and sandstone is sort of like a fun in between. And then of course you can find all kinds of other sorts of rock around the world, but those are the, the main kinds that you spend most of your time climbing on. So the next question comes from Max Zalotkin, uh, Sea of Czars, and he asks, where do you see the future of rock climbing in 2040? It's kind of hard to imagine because if I think of climbing in the year 2000 versus where it is right now, it's hard to imagine what another 20 years will do. I think one of the things that I'm interested in in the, the sort of future of climbing is that in the next 20 years, will equipment manufacturers sort of up the level a little bit? So far, I don't think there have been any big incentives to, to make cutting edge, futuristic, you know, ultra light gear, just because there's not that big a market for it. But with climbing in the Olympics now and people competing at a much higher level, I wonder if there will be more money in the sport, like there will be greater incentives to create sort of futuristic gear. And I think that'd be pretty cool, you know, harnesses that are basically like mesh bags, you know, things that are ultra, ultra light. Those are all the questions. Hope you guys learned something. Until next time.